everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of the EMS Handoff Podcast, your source for all things EMS. Before we get back to uh, my co-hosts for this week, I would like to thank our uh, host, Jim's, for all they do for us. So make sure and go by their website and take a look at what they're doing for everything they're doing for EMS, including seeing all of our prior episodes on their website at gems.com. So as we start back this week, we bring back my fellow co-host, Eric McCullough and Bradley Dean, the host of, the hosts with the most, I guess you could say. So, uh, you know, just uh, sitting here and, and all this uh, fun stuff, we've got a lot of growth and uh, a lot of things going on with the EMS handoff. And uh, so let's just see how things are going. Bradley Dean, another week. Yes, Living sir. Like a rock star, aren't you? Yeah, trying to get a few things done in the office today and uh, decided I would stay here while we do our recording tonight. Uh, there you go. So uh, no no secrets coming, but uh, I hear that you've been working on getting a couple of uh, big, uh, big guests scheduled on for the next coming weeks. Got some good things coming. Yes, sir. I'm trying to get those scheduled thanks to you and uh... – stuff from Eric. We're going to get them on here and uh, hopefully get that scheduled over the next couple of months. All right. So uh, with that, we've got, we've got some good, we've had some good people. We've got some good people tonight and we're going to have some more good people coming forward. So uh, Bradley always on top of that. And then uh, going back to, you know, I love this. We can do the, the right side, which really looks like your left side you come from Bradley to go over here for, for Eric back in the middle Tennessee area. So, uh, you know, living it up there in Nash Vegas. Yep. Trying, trying to stay as secluded as possible, but that doesn't always happen. Um, while I have an opportunity, I'm hoping by the time this podcast release, we'll have a website. If not, the website is pending. So in addition to our awesome Facebook group, we will have another, uh, another outlet for, um, our resources and content, which will be our website. And like I said, hopefully by the time this comes out, it'll be created. If not, it'll be, it'll be coming within the next, uh, next little bit after that. Like I said, all things uh, EMS is growing. We're uh, getting a website developed. You've got the Instagram page out there, uh, seeing a lot of good stuff. We've had the content coming there uh, and, and really kind of the hits just keep on rolling. So by the time this, this episode comes out. We think there's a, a lot of good things in the mix. So hopefully uh, all of you out there in the, the handoff world uh, like everything that's going on. If you do, make sure and hit us up and let us know what's going on. But enough with all of us, Bradley. Let's kick off. I think uh, we can celebrate tonight by saying this is our first ever in the history of the tidbits and now the handoff that uh, we've ever had a two-time guest on our show. So let's, let's kick it off. So our, our guest tonight is very passionate about uh, volunteers and uh, EMS. So our guest tonight has been an EMS since 2004 and works as an attorney for Texas state government. Uh, he's been a primarily a volunteer with multiple different agencies in central Texas and the Houston area, both uh, suburban and rural. So Wes uh, Ogilvie is a, currently a paramedic in FTO with West EMS and a paramedic with Huffman EMS. He's an instructor. He has uh, written several periodicals and co-authored the Medical Legal Chapter of Paramedic Care, Principles and Practice. Wes, thanks you, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you all for the invite. So, all right, Wes. It's time to, to rock. You volunteered to be on our show? And we're going to talk about volunteers. Be, I volunteered to talk about volunteer EMS. Hey, that's the best thing, right? So uh, volunteerism and EMS. Uh, let, let's go ahead. You kick it off for us, sir. All right. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a uh, really uh, crazy controversial position. There is, no, there, there is not a shortage of volunteers for EMS. What I will say is there are a shortage of agencies that know how to recruit, retain, and use volunteers effectively. So I, I think, uh, you know, so you basically summed up everything or, or 
hour is done, we're good to go. Uh, but no, tonight we're going to get into each of those areas right there. And really, uh, we can take a look at this, not only just the volunteerism, but uh, kind of every uh, avenue. So well, one of the things I think uh, we, we kind of talk about first is the volunteer EMS organizations. Uh, in, in some areas, uh, volunteers are uh, the primary backbone. They are the system. So just out of curiosity, have you done any studies as to uh, the prevalence of volunteer uh, agencies or organizations throughout the country? Uh, in the EMS professions? Anecdotally, yes. Professionally, uh, professionally, academically, no. Okay. And what, what I have seen are, at least down here in Texas, are two models. There is one model, which is very rare, which is the almost all volunteer agency. You're more likely to see that as a fire department or as an EMS first, what, what we in Texas call an EMS first response organization, which is an agency that provides care but does not transport. And the other model that you see, I won't even say fairly regularly, but is the more common model for volunteer EMS, at least in the Lone Star State, because we know that EMS begins and ends with Texas. Uh, also, we could say that about barbecue, but I, I've got two North Carolinians and uh, someone from West Tennessee, from uh, Central or East Tennessee, I forget where, and I know that I'm outnumbered on that, but uh, Brad, Bradley knows where the brisket is. Um, brisket, you get, you get brisket. But the other model that, I, that we see is the combination department, where you have a combination of paid and volunteer staff. You see that with fire departments and you see that with EMS uh, only agencies. One of, the, one of the two volunteer organizations I'm with we only have two paid guys and they are the guys who run the department and run weekday call. And the other department, uh, we actually are almost all paid. We've got four volunteers on the roster and I'm the only ALS provider who's a volunteer. So I've seen the entire gamut. So as we take a look, there, there was a point in time in which these volunteer agencies had a tremendous amount of individuals uh, that were staffing their services. Is that not correct? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the two organizations I'm with used to have probably 60 plus volunteers. Now, and we probably still have a fair amount on the roster, but I think one thing you see with volunteer organizations, whether it's EMS, whether it's fire, whether it's a garden club, is there are a lot of people on the roster. There may be a lot of people on the roster, but there's that there's that much smaller percentage of people who you can rely on to cut to get things done and get things covered. And About how long has this been going on? I think it's been going on for years. And here's a fundamental belief that I have about any career. I'm an attorney and I can tell you a story about, in fact, I'm going to tell you a story about that because I think it's very illustrative. Um, years ago, one of my first attorney jobs, I was at a state agency in Texas. Um, and management, in fact, all the way up to senior management said, we've got, a re we've got a retention problem. We're losing attorneys all the time. And every attorney would say, or a lot of them was when they asked them why you leave, well, you just weren't paying me enough. And so they decided we're going to, we're going to do a massive salary increase. And they thought, God only knows where they found the money. I don't know if they started cranking it out on a print, on a printing press. I never I never checked to see if it bounced. Obviously, I guess not because I'm still getting I still got paid by them. But they were still losing people. I have always taken the position that it's never about the pay. You know what the pay is coming in to any job. They're going to tell you, and if you're with a volunteer organization, they're going to tell you you're not getting paid. What they do not tell you is what do you have to put up with for the pay? What is your BS quotient? And that on the volunteer side is huge, in my opinion, because if you're not going to get paid and you have to jump through a lot of hoops and do a lot of, and I'm not saying, 
I'm not saying that it's an excuse to be unprofessional or not hold up to the same standards, but when the BS factor outweighs the fun factor, that's when people leave. I know that's when I've left. So it's kind of funny that you mentioned this, and uh, I'm going to use just a, a brief story from, from my family's history. In fact, I actually had this conversation just, uh, 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 I believe it was last weekend. Uh, I was talking to an individual that kind of took over a role that my grandmother previously had. Uh, many years ago, the American Red Cross across the country had what they called first aid station teams. Now, that was a term they came up with at a, one point in time to uh, do some of what you're talking about, but at, at, that, at that point in time, these organizations were, were staffed with volunteers that were trained from just basic first aid and CPR up to uh, individuals that were pre-hospital and hospital trained as well. Uh, and they would do uh, just basic medical coverage at special events throughout the uh, that throughout their area. And in, in our area, uh, it was um, concerts, hockey uh, matches, um, wrestling events, football games, uh, the the local fair, and everything. And, and my grandmother actually ran the. Uh, the, the, the staffing basically for those. And I, I remember uh, getting the phone calls of the house. Hey, beginning of the month, here's the calendar. This is the event I want to work. This is the event I want to work. Uh, and it, at times we would actually have to say, you know, we've got all the people that we can take at this moment, you know, and we would have events where we'd have 18, 20 people. And, uh, you know, and then there were uh, time after that, um, there were different things and, and all of them, I think we're, we're getting ready to start to hit, um, started to come about. And then, then there were events where we got to the point where there was nobody at all that wanted to sign up. And, and part of that became, they started to expect additional things, they, uh, you know, additional training requirements and, and uh, various different things that they, would have to do and and so we started to see those volunteers actually get to the point where there were events that my grandmother and my mother would be the only two that would that would be there so. and I th i'm glad you mentioned the training because that's something that i always see as an issue um in fact i had this i actually ran the volunteer side of one of my departments years ago and they wanted volunteers to come in on a weekday for about two or three days for new hire orientation. Well, what I found is that a lot of people volunteering in EMS, and I'm, I've got my own theory on who volunteers in EMS, I'll talk about that in a second, but a lot of people who are volunteering in EMS are people who do something else. You know, they're an engineer, they're a photographer, they're an attorney, whatever. And they also have their EM, their first responder, their EMT, their advanced, their paramedic, whatever. And they want to be on the truck, whether it's to get experience, whether it's to keep skills up, whatever. And if you tell someone you're going to have to take two days off your off your day job to come in and sit through orientation, you probably already lost a significant number of interested people right there. I can't, you know, can't afford to do it. Not gonna do it. Um, I'm not going to lose my vacation time to help you guys out. And one of the things that I did was I said, okay, what, what are we actually covering in the orientation? Well, here's all the PowerPoints. Why can't we send them to the person? Why can't we send them the PowerPoints and say, give them an acknowledgement. I am responsible for knowing this stuff and I agree to be held accountable. And I've had the opportunity to ask and know who to ask if I have questions about any of this stuff. And what I found was that we could, we could get people by sending on that material and holding them responsible to it, we could get people on the truck within the week. And what I found with volunteers is the quicker you get, get the hook into them, the more likely they are to get active and stay active. If you tell them, well, we're not doing volunteer orientation until, you know, we, we do it twice a year. I've heard that one. Or we do it when we have enough people who've signed up. Well, by the time you come up and say, hey, Bradley, are you still in, are you still interested in co coming on our volunteer department? Well, I, 
I was interested, but XYZ department picked me up or my plans have changed and I'm no longer interested in doing it. I wish you'd, I wish you'd called me when I applied. So when we talk, when we talk about volunteerism, especially in the EMS community, uh, you know, these individuals are running calls just like their, their paid counterparts out there. So we're looking at minimums of EMT, advanced EMT and paramedic, uh, depending on which part of the country that you're in. So uh, in addition to running those roles uh, on, on the volunteer side, there's obviously additional training requirements that you have to, to take on. One, the first part is, you know, your initial licensure. Uh, and to get into the profession, you know, each one has got obviously a, a very specific amount of uh, training hours or education hours that they have to complete. And then subsequently after that, all the states have a continuing education requirement. Um, but in addition to that, I'm sure uh, you're aware, like you said, some of them are fire-based uh, EMS uh, agencies, uh, some of them are, are just EMS agencies in general, um, they have additional requirements on top of those continuing education. Um, so as we take a look at that, you know, people are, are right now are working more and or even in today's environment may not be able to go out as much due to their concerns about the, the pandemic environment. Um, are our ways of training as you were kind of alluding to with the orientation, are our current education methodologies in line with what we need to be doing to make sure that we keep our volunteers in place, getting them in place and keeping them there? Short answer, no. Short answer, no. I don't know how many departments I have seen that say we have a, you know, we have a training meeting it's every other uh, se second and fourth Monday of every month had that. Um, you got you got to be at X number of trainings. OK. I think that we do need to mandate training. Absolutely. We're going to have to have continued education. And I think I think it benefits to train as a group for the department because a that way you learn how each other work. And I my first volunteer department what I was told is the more we see you around the station, the more we sit, the more we see you at training, the more we're going to trust you to do things. Don't, uh, you know, if you don't show up ever, and then you, if you don't show up to the training, if you don't show up at the station and hang out around the station, don't show up to a major car wreck and expect us to hand you the hydraulic tools. But we can certainly do ways of making, making that more flexible. Um, again, like I talked about, on, only having the training during during weekday business hours, that doesn't work. I would argue even that only having the training at one specific time doesn't work. So, you know, it's pretty easy with the technology we have today, with the technology that we have access to, to say, you know what, we're going to video this training. We're going to put it on, heck, you don't even have to have a website. We're going to put it on our department's uh, private Facebook group. We're going to put it up on YouTube. We're going to do things like that to make the training available. Because if you if you say we're going to have a mandatory training on Tuesday night and everyone who doesn't show up is kick, kicked off the roster, guess what? You've now created more of that volunteer crisis of not have of not having people who otherwise were doing a good job, perhaps. Perhaps they weren't. Perhaps that's your excuse to get rid of them. But if you make the training available, you've created a no excuse environment. Do you, do you think that making that training available will help incentivize? Because like, uh, I mean, making it more accessible where, yeah, I could watch the video on Tuesday afternoon or whatever. But when I see that they're actually doing the video um, have you seen like people are like, well, actually, I kind of want to be there the next time because, yeah, this was decent training, but it would be better to be physically present. So do you think that's an incentive to make it more accessible that you would actually get more people coming to the physical location to do it? Potentially, I, I think, you know, one of the things I've seen with a lot of departments is the challenge is people don't know that there's a training always. I think I think communications is a huge issue with volunteers and you've got to figure out multiple ways to do it you know 
and I'm dating myself on the internet, I realize as I say this, but the old Yahoo groups were phenomenal for that. You created, you create a Yahoo group for the department, you get everyone's email in it, and, and you know what, even if you only have the chief or the training officer is the only person authorized to send emails to that group, guess what, you, you get the post that says, hey, we're having a training on this. Hey, we're, hey we're, we're doing continuing education this night. Hey, we need help for this. Uh, if you don't have a uniform shirt, please let us know. Things like that. You've just got to have that communication because if you don't hear from, if you don't hear from people, if you don't hear from the department, you're like, do they not want me? Uh, obviously, th or things are going okay. I guess they don't need the help. And you don't realize that, uh, you know, you had to down the second ambulance because you didn't have a crew. So one of the things that ties a lot of this uh, together is time and the incentivized time as well. So a lot of things what we've talked about is money in itself. So you've already alluded to it just a little bit as we've already been talking about it that maybe the Monday through Friday nine to five kind of thing is their primary time to get their money to, to live. And then this is something that is additional to that. So as we take a look at the current environment, the current economic environment, are people still able to afford to volunteer with organizations such as these? I would say yes and no. I think you're probably able to afford it, but it's going to get, exp it, it has potential to get expensive quickly. I, you know, I can talk about, I've seen every extreme. I've seen the department that says, um, all we're going to do is issue you one t-shirt or polo shirt for a uniform and you're on, you're on your own for the rest. I've seen others, they're like, here's two polos, here's two, here's two t-shirts, here's a couple pairs of pants, here's a fleece, here's a heavy coat, um, and here's a class A uniform shirt. Wit, wit, and my first fire chief was phenomenal about this. He said, I am of the philosophy that it should not cost you money to volunteer. And it easily does in a lot of these departments because, you know, again, I live in Central Texas. Um, we do get cool occasionally here. I mean, obviously not to the extent that, say, North Dakota does. But if I'm in a department and all you've done is issued me a T-shirt or a polo, pretty soon I'm going, you know, I could really use a jacket. And, I, and you talk about incentivizing. That's something I've seen departments do. I've done it at departments I've been at, and I've seen leadership in other departments. Um, one of the departments I was at not that long ago, that uh, we ran a Excel spreadsheet every month showing how active people were on calls. They had gotten a little bit of money for parkas, heavy reflective uh, jackets. They said, we, we're, we're going to buy five at a time. Guess how they picked who the five were? The five the people who were the most calls. The five most active individuals because A, it's incentivizing it, and B, they're going to be the ones most likely to need it. So let's look on the uh, flip side of that is, are we seeing individuals that are not volunteering because they would much rather be paid? I don't know if that's the case. What I do see with some volunteers and with some departments is people use volunteering as a way to get experience to get hired either at that department or elsewhere. I mean, bluntly, there are a ton of people out there with an EMT cert who would love to be doing EMS or firefighting full time. They get on with, you know, they get on with the whichever volunteer department, they can say, well, you know what, I've been a volunteer with this department. I've done some of the work. They now have some experience to set to to uh, compete against that person who just got their EMT certification and has no experience. If nothing else, they know what a stretcher looks like. They know how they have a general idea of how the stretcher works because. And we could we, this is a whole nother podcast. 
but we could certainly talk about some of the things that don't get covered initial EMS education. And most of those are the operational tasks of being an EMT or paramedic. Yeah, and how fluid so those, have, those change. And I think that's another part of like being, being integrated into the training a little bit more uh, because I mean, all it takes is one month of not being somewhere and a radio protocol has changed, uh, a monitor pro setting has changed. And while it's not a big deal to the people who are there all the time, for the one person who comes there every now and then, it's like, oh, that's a major uh, thing I have to think about. Um, well, and it's funny. I, I was at one department and they're probably going to know who it is after I say this, but I've been there over a year. I'm at and it's scary. I'm actually one of our more experienced paramedics there, which is a whole different story, but was having problems with the stretcher. Boss finally pulled me inside and said, hey, did you know we had, did you know that we used DeWalt batteries on two of the ambulances and striker batteries on two, on the other two ambulances? And the DeWalts and strikers charge and work a little differently. And I looked at him and I said, no one ever told me this. And you start to find that list. And I think it's true with paid EMS too. You start to find that list of things no one ever told me. You know, one of the best trainings I ever had was at a, an all volunteer fire department. And I'm gonna pull, I, I forget if this is all audio, but I'm, I'm pulling up a handheld scanner right here. And we're gonna pretend that it's actually a real radio. Um, our training captain, who was a really nice guy, very much your classic country good old boy, didn't have a lot of what you would call formal education, but had a ton of experience of things that you actually needed to know in the fire and EMS world. He said, everyone bring in your radio tonight. For, everyone bring in your radio for the training if you've been issued a radio. We spent an hour with the radio going through each channel and each setting to talk about when we would use it and why we would use it and how to use it. That's practical training. And you're right. If you don't have that stuff, if you don't make that information available, you know, and you see it a lot more at the fire departments than you do EMS, I think, but a pass on book or a board with, with the latest memos and changes, that's huge. That's a huge way to, keep people informed so and, and you're you're talking about the technology um you know with everybody pretty much having an iphone android whatever it is i mean there's almost no excuse as to why the communication isn't streamlined but i would say conversely there might be a movement to too much communication on those channels where um you know you wake up one morning and you look and you got 52 missed messages and five of them were critical the other were just people bantering have you seen that any in some of like the newer, I guess, ways to communicate? Yes and no. Um, one of my departments, we don't have social media, but we all do have department email, which is phenomenal because our director will send out, e she usually sends out emails about once a week, maybe, maybe twice a week with stuff that she wants you to know. And she actually re says, please reply back to say that you have read this email so that she can hold you accountable. The other department, uh, we are very technologically challenged, would be a nice way to put it. Um, the only real technological communication that we have with each other, we have a private Facebook page that really doesn't get a lot of stuff put out by management. We have one person who, and I'm, tr I'm trying to keep this as anonymous as possible, but we have one person who, in addition to being one of our volunteers, is also active with the local hospitals. And that person will occasionally put stuff up from the hospitals. And then there's a bunch of jokes that go on there. And occasional announcements about training. And so you're like, you know, if you don't get a notification on Facebook, you don't remember to go over there and check. But then you go over and look and you're like, why do I even bother? There is nothing here that's relevant to me. And with that department, we don't have online scheduling, which I think, oh, that is that is a huge thing. If you make it easy for people, you make it easy for people to volunteer in the beginning. I mean, 
and I'm, I'm sidetracking myself here and I apologize. How many volunteer departments have a web page or have a Facebook page? Not all of them. There's a significant chunk that don't. And of those that do, how many of them have application material online? How many of them have a point of contact? You know, if you have to hunt for how for how to get a hold of this organization to volunteer, that doesn't send a real good impression at the first part. But anyways, going back to the online scheduling, if you make it easy for people to sign up for a shift, guess what? They're more likely to sign up. You know, when I was what the first one of the first departments I was at in Houston, Harris County Emergency Services District 1, which has since changed, we had online scheduling. We had a program called When to Work. Every, tr every truck worked a 24-hour shift, but they divided it into 12-hour blocks so that people could sign up for overtime or whatever. Every truck had four spots on it. There was what they called an in-charge, which is the lead paramedic attendant, which was the EMT, advanced, or paramedic who was assisting. You had a slot for a student and you had a slot for a volunteer. Guess what? You go over, click on volunteer, and poof, you're on. If you had been cleared to write as a second, as a second crew member or the primary, they had they had altered when to work so you could sign up for one of those slots. When there's when there's an opening, made things real easy. You go to another department that was up the road. Yes, volunteers can get on the schedule, but you've got to you've got to call this woman. And since no one's going to know that I'm saying Cypress Creek EMS, you've got to call Don Stumbo, Monday through Friday during business hours. And either either talk to her personally or leave a message in our voicemail and say, hey, Don, this is Wes. I would I would like to write as a third on Medic 511 on Saturday, not on Saturday from uh, 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. Or I want all 24 or whatever. And then you and then you would have to keep clicking back on. Then you would have to keep clicking back on when to work to see if she had gotten you on the schedule. Again, if you make it easy, you take away the excuses for why people can't be active. And then you can hold them accountable. Because that's one of the big things. I don't think, and I, I hear this fairly regularly from paid firefighters and paid EMS personnel, volunteers aren't held to the same standard. First of all, I think that's true in some organizations. It shouldn't be, but it is true. What we need to say is we hold everyone to the same standards. The only difference between the paid guys and the volunteers is we may be a little more flexible in how we get to those standards. You know, if you're working Monday through Friday, uh, you know, eight to five normal business hours, you can't be put on a rotating shift schedule to be with an FTO. You may have to say, well, you know, we know that David, you know, works Monday through Friday in an office. He can only come in on Saturdays and some Sundays. Okay, da David, we're going to put you on a 24 every Saturday. You may not be with the same FTO, but you're going through the same FTO process. That's our flexibility. Or we know that Brad Bradley's got another job. Bradley, you still have to do the training but it's available on the department's website and you can just download it and watch it and take a quiz. That's, that's, how you, that's how you keep the same standards. You keep the same standards, but you show flexibility. So let's take a, uh, let's take a fork in this road and instead of talking where we currently are, we're gonna start talking about the process of getting some of these individuals in. And uh, I think uh, this is a, a very interesting conversation because uh, even uh, where where I am uh, having conversation with my, my former uh, full-time fire department, uh, the EMS agencies in our region, as well as the law enforcement uh, sides, we actually have a law enforcement representative on our advisory board, and he actually serves now in the recruiting role for their law enforcement side. So even recruiting for paid positions is something that is uh, very difficult. Uh, so when we talk about the volunteer side, where we're competing against people having full-time jobs, they they uh, are, are looking for spending time at home with families, maybe furthering their education, doing all this different stuff. How do we then 
approach and those individuals and and bring them into our organization. I'll go to what my first fire chief said about that, David. I had a wonderful first fire chief and I would still be there if it wasn't for some other reasons. Ma mainly, we just didn't run enough calls and we didn't function at an advanced level. Once I got found paramedic, I was like, I'm gonna sit here for a 24 hour shift and run one call and function at the EMT level. It's not a good, it's not a good match anymore. But my first fire chief had a saying that he said, I can find something to do for anyone who comes in and volunteers. And this was a fire department. We, we were a combination fire department with paid and volunteer staff. We actually, and he was no longer there, but before I was there, we had a gentleman who was missing an arm. He had, been, he had, had his arm amputated. And you, Chief Crane said, you know what? We're gonna train you how to do accountability. We're going, we're going to give you the, that whiteboard and you're going to be responsible for tracking everyone at a fire scene. And guess what? That guy, according to Chief Crane at least, was the best guy they'd ever had at accountability. What, and I'll expand on that. There are quite a few fire departments around here that claim they still take volunteers. Call them up. Hey, I want to volunteer to be a firefighter. Hey, no problem, man. But I don't want to be an EMT. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You call it the same fire department. Hey, I'm an EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic, and I'd like to do the medical side only. Sorry, we don't have any roles for you. I, I take the position that if you bring someone on with a skill set, whatever it is, whether it's EMS, whether it's fire, whether it's even IT, communications, whatever, you are freeing up one of your other trained and or paid personnel to do what it is that they do. A few years ago, we had a massive brush fire outbreak in Austin, in the Austin area, 2011. And I could go into the politics of the Austin fire and EMS world for that. That's probably two podcasts put together and it would put everyone to sleep. But all of our, we used to have all volunteer fire departments outside the city of Austin. Travis County was all volunteer, had about 12 to 13 volunteer fire departments. They all gradually went paid and they said, we don't need volunteers anymore because you know what? We can get mutual aid from the department down the road. It's great until you have a massive disaster. There is no mutual aid. Mutual aid was the state bringing in resources from Dallas, Houston, other parts of the state and saying, you know, the Texas Forest Service is coming, but they're not gonna be there for a day or two. So you had no additional personnel you could rely on and the fire departments at that point told EMS, we're not going on medical calls anymore. Sorry about your bad luck. Whereas you say, you know what? We, we have this guy on the roster who's an EMT. We have another person who, let's say she's cleared to drive trucks. You give the two of them the keys to the Tahoe, the Suburban, the pickup, and say, you know what? Y'all are now in service as the medical first response unit. It, free, it frees up those uh, paid or tr otherwise trained firefighters to go fight the wildfire. It enables you to keep providing service. So basically what I'm hearing first is you've got to have a plan to make use of any phone call that comes in. Absolutely. And you've got to act on that phone call. Sorry, I don't mean to get... I don't mean to get uh, agitated here, but you got to have someone who picks up the phone when you call them and who has answers. I, a few years ago, um, I saw a volunteer EMS service outside of San Antonio put up a thing. Um, National Volunteer Week. We're looking for some volunteers. Contact us via Facebook. Beep. Hey, I'm a paramedic in, I'm a paramedic in Austin. Um, what, I'm interested in volunteering. What do I do? Well, you need to come down and fill out an application and we'll, t and we'll tell you about all about it. How quickly do you think I followed up on that? Called Probably not very. One of the departments I was, I, in fact, the department I'm with now, West, I Facebook messaged them and said, are you taking volunteers? Yes, we are. What level are you? Licensed paramedic and EMS instructor. What's your phone number? I'll call you now. 
boy, you talk you, you you talk about throwing the hook in the water and getting someone. Guy answered all my questions and I said, well, I'm going up that way anyways, uh, Friday. Well, just come on by the station and we'll talk. I show up, we talk for a bit. He shows me around, hands me the application, says, fill this out. He says, and by the way, I, I talked to a couple of your friends, uh, a couple of people you're friends with on Facebook. They said, you're a pretty good paramedic. We'd love to have you. Obviously, the people he talked to on Facebook don't know what the heck they're talking about, but I, well, I, hadn't, I hadn't killed anyone in a while, so I guess I'm doing okay. So, you know, I, the way I take a look at, at recruiting, recruiting's got to be a proactive approach. So what, one of the things you're talking about right now is very much reactive. You're making the assumption that somebody is going to make a phone call, stop in your station, send a Facebook group, which... Uh, no matter what, your recruiting program has to uh, take uh, take that as a component. Uh, but, you know, as I've thought about this more here recently, when we talk about the uh, shortage of individuals working uh, on on the units, I, I look at the military, right? And, and for many, many decades now, we've had an all-volunteer military here in the United States, but yet we still have recruiting centers and just about every, at least every large uh, municipality across the country, uh, but even some in the rural areas. And those individuals are prepared for that, uh, that uh, reactive side where somebody does actually come or call or uh, you know, send a message out, but they're also proactive. They're going out and taking a look. They're engaging with uh, the communities through, you know, the high schools, through the colleges, through the, uh, those type of uh, places, going to recruiting job fairs and saying, hey, come. Uh, I'm going to tell you about something that I saw that was very successful. We all, we all know the axiom about work that you can't get a job without experience. You can't get experience without a job. We've heard, I think we've all heard that ad nauseum. When I was at Harris County, Several of our uh, EMTs and paramedics were clinical faculty for a couple of the EMS education programs in the area. They were the ones doing the skills instruction. They occasionally covered lectures, etc. They would always tell the people who were in the inter at the time it was intermediate, now advanced, and paramedic classes, hey, you've already got an EMT certification. Let me tell you about a way that you can start getting 911 ambulance experience while you're still in school. You would be surprised how many people signed up for that because they knew that it would set them ahead and apart from everyone else applying for an EMS job. First of all, if you're at that agency and, have a good, and had a good track record, there was a pretty good chance they're going to say, well, now that, now that you graduated and got your paramedic, why don't we put you on the payroll? And even if not, you, you can apply anywhere else and say, I while I was in paramedic class, I would, you know, in addition to my clinicals and all my other stuff, I was working a lot of weekends on the ambulance and getting that 911 experience and exposure that, you, that you're asking for. If nothing else, you know what a stair chair looks like and you know how to put it together. So I, I, I actually uh, came across this quote uh, again today. Um, and it's one that I've seen and actually used multiple times. But it, so it's quite interesting that, uh, that you bring it up. Uh, the way that you just did, because as soon as you did, it kind of hit uh, hit me in the head uh, here. But uh, it's a, it's a quote uh, referencing the chief financial officer to the, the CEO, and it's uh, from uh, Richard Branson, who uh, owns uh, Virgin. Virgin. And uh, it says, "What happens?" Or it says, C "CFO to the CEO, what happens if we invest in developing our people and then they leave us?" And the CEO goes, what happens if we don't and they stay? And I think that's a, a great point there that uh, when, when you're talking about this, especially in the volunteer community, uh, if, if those organizations kind of know the niche that they feel, you know, they're, they're there for patient care and handling the community. And that's the organization, as they say, whether it's a volunteer, all volunteer, whether it's combination uh, type agencies, if they know that that can be a stepping stone to either their own paid staff or paid staff around, uh, then you develop that and you bring that in. And, and, and we say, 
hey Wes, you know, you're you're at this agent or you're at this place. I, I would love for you to come out, you know, going to that college, going to that high school, going to that event and say, hey, you know, we have this great opportunity that's coming. Uh, you know, this is what we can offer. You know, we're we've got the this clothing allowance that you can use. We can do this, but one of the key things is is of our people, they stay with us about 24 months and they're going on to work for this fire department or this ambulance service and they're getting these opportunities to go into these organizations and you say hey 95 percent of our people do this within this period of time are you the next one to fill this awesome position because we've got one coming up and you know you create that buzz that excitement that uh epiphany is, hey this is what I, I need to do this this is coming up this is awesome and i can get everything i want out of it well and i think one i think two other things that you do are number one most since a lot of your volunteers have are getting paid to do something else somewhere else you say hey what else do you do we we had two people at harris county when i was volunteer coordinator who were professional photographers guess what all of all of the department events we had someone there to take photos we had we had people to do photos for training things like that I'm an attorney, and obviously there's there's some ethical issues that come up. But hey, uh, where can can you help us draft a policy? Hey, can you look over this policy? You utilize people's skills to their maximum. And the other thing that I did, especially for our people that were in EMS education, or you know, were currently in an education program, whether they were learning how to be a advanced paramedic, whatever. I would say, hey, what is it you want to do in EMS? And at the time, Harris County, we had a critical care program. Uh, you know what? Let, let me get you scheduled to write as a third on the CCT truck. Let, let's get you exposed to that. We, ha uh, we had people who were in school, and even though we couldn't give them the clinical credit, they're like, I need, I need some bad calls to see. Let me have you ride with the, with the district supervisor because they go on all uh, – they. At the time, they went on shootings, stabbings, serious injury, car accidents, and cardiac arrests. Let's get you to go. Let's get you to go with them, so you'll be more prepared when you're doing your clinicals. Hey, I'm curious how dispatch works. Let me call the let me call the comm center manager, and see if we can get you an observation shift in dispatch. If you if you know it's that whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you meet people's needs. They're going to be happy, and they're probably more likely to stay. Whereas you have other departments that are kind of the good old boys club. Um, you have you have the monthly meeting, where if Jim Bob proposes it, everyone's going to go along with it. And hey, we've got we've got the state such and such uh, training conference. Well, you know, Larry and Ed always go every year. Let's send Larry and Ed again, and uh, let's give them let's give them a budget to go because we know Larry and Ed are going to get drunk at the conference. And when you create that good old boy environment, and I mean, I'm I'm in Texas, y'all are in the Carolinas and uh, Tennessee. There's nothing wrong with good old boys, but when you create that incestuous environment where it's the same people always benefiting, pretty pretty soon you go what's in it for me and again that maslow's hierarchy of needs comes into comes into play but it comes into play against the department you know larry larry and ed and jim bob have you know they've got full uniforms i've been here a year and a half running med calls and i've got a t-shirt um larry ed and jim bob have a handheld radio and we never see them on calls So with that, you make a very valuable point because this actually goes back to uh, some research that, that has uh, recently uh, been done and uh, it was actually published. This this was actually coming from the uh, Georgia EMS workforce study uh, that was sent, I believe it was 2019 uh, when it finished and started coming out. And in it, they talk about, uh, because one of the first things that most people talk about is EMS, people don't say in EMS because the money is not there. And uh, most of the respondents in here were basically putting that down in the 
second, third, and fourth categories. And, and some of the ones that uh, we, we mentioned here, which to make a good retention program, a recruiting and retention program is to say, hey, we value you. And look, this is what we're going to invest into you. We're going to, you know, when we, we're going to have this open and, and uh, designed training program that makes sure that you have the information, but we also know that you can't get here. So we would love to have you every, you know, second, uh, you know, second and fourth uh, week at the training, but we know that uh, because of your family and your job, you can't do that. So we'd love you here as much as we can. We're going to do this uh, floating that you can do this uh, offsite if you need to. We've got uniforms for you. Bo oh yeah, by the way, you'll get uh, opportunities to go work at the concerts that are in our area or uh, sporting events that are in the area you choose and you can pick some of uh, those dates. So uh, if, if your kid is on the, the sports team, you can not only watch the game and support them, but you can also get some of your time here uh, as well. Uh, but in addition to, to in. that, do what? And not pay to go in and not pay to and, go in. And not pay to go in, right? Uh, and then not only that, but we have, you know, regular uh, uh, appreciation awards that we do and, and make sure that during the training event, you recognize, you know, those high performers and those that are, you know, making the, uh, the need uh, to do. It's that value, it's that um, intrinsic, uh, not even intrinsic value, but the uh, internal value, the, the how to build me up, not necessarily put pad in my pocket, but build me up as an individual. Um, and, and those pretensions, uh, recruiting uh, should potentially, if done well, uh, increase. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, you find out you find out what motivates people, what they're interested in, and you find a way to match that to what your department's needs are. If you've got, you know, we had someone at a department. I won't I won't say which department, I won't say who it was. She was a marginally competent EMT volunteer. Marginally competent. Not dangerous, just not that good. But she loved doing PR events. Guess what? PIO. Hey, well, we didn't make her PIO per se, but hey, um, we saw that such and such preschool wants an ambulance to come, and she was retired. Can you can can you come in and pick and pick up a spare ambulance and take her to the preschool? Never got a no from her. She did a few less 911 shifts. Everybody was happy because the paid crews didn't feel they had to watch her all the time. And guess what? The PRs are getting covered. You find you find what what, what motivates people. You know, and it's silly, but even your most expensive uniform jacket. And, you know, let's go into the fancy five level ones. You know, you're looking at just under 400 bucks. How many, how many shifts of, how many overtime shifts are you paying for a paid guy? When, if you had said, you know what, we know that what motivates Eric is having, is having all the uniform stuff to look just like everyone else in the department. Hey, Eric, if you can help, if you can help me out with, if you can help me out with these, uh, two shifts that we can't get anyone to cover or an event, I'll, I'll bet, I'll bet we can get that 511 Parker ordered for you. What, what what's your, what's, what's your size? Uh, I think a lot of what you've kind of talked about and uh, uh, I, I, I remember one of the, the former guests that we had uh, used to have a, a picture on his, I think it was his LinkedIn account and it actually showed the bottom of the trash can and there was a little sticker at the bottom of the trash can that said the way you've always done it. And uh, really kind of think that that's uh, something that we uh, should take a look at here when it comes to recruiting and retention. You know, uh, we're in a time where we're competing for every hour for every person that's out there. If there's a, if there's a service that's paying a little bit more, you know, we're seeing that uh, uh, transition over. And especially when it comes to, to money, uh, we're, we're, when it when it comes to volunteerism, we're we're touching something other than just that intrinsic that that monetary value. So, we've got to kind of look away from the way we've always done it. We got to look away and, from the way we've always done it, 
and we've got to be flexible with with how with how we do the things that we have to do. You know, I'll give a great example. I, there are several departments out there that have a 48 hour a month requirement. Are you going to turn an experienced paramedic away because I can only do one 24 hour shift? No. And yet these departments will. I'll give you another great example. There was one department I talked to a while back. I'm not going to name who they are. It's not important, but it was going to be a drive for me. I knew that. Uh, hey, I'd like to apply. Well, what we need you to do is come down on a Tuesday evening to our to our monthly membership meeting. I need you to come to two of those and introduce yourself, and then we'll vote you in. Hey, I'm I'm at work till 5 p.m. Well, that's how we do it. And that's a big thing to me. I see a lot of these departments that still have that membership committee or that vote you in. And that can get real ugly and nasty quickly. I've been in, I've been in some of those departments and, you know, we're going to have we're going to have Fred, who's applying for membership, step out of the room while we discuss it. If you're in a smaller community, hey, did you remember when Fred, dear, dear, when Fred got caught doing X, Y, Z? Dear that Fred's dear that Fred used to be an alcoholic. Did you know Fred's wife is African American? Gets ugly real quick. And it certainly can. That it certainly can. It, and it really becomes, you know, a lot of these, and I've said this before on my blog, a lot of these smaller rural uh, volunteer public safety organizations, whether it's EMS or fire or both, I've described them as uh, social clubs with uh, really cool apparatus in the garage. And there's there's that mindset a lot of times. Um I know, uh, I won't say who, but I've heard of more than one volunteer fire department in the state of Texas that uh, had beer machines in the station. And uh, training meeting is, uh, they put some PowerPoints on and uh, crack open a cold one. Yep. And we, kn these are the same people that say, we're unpaid professionals. Well, I will tell you something. There's the occasional scandal, but I doubt the Charlotte Fire Department or uh, Boston EMS um, get snockered during their training. My guess is, is if, if they did, you would hear about it and those people would no longer be in the fire service or, or EMS, at least as a paid employee. They'd end up at that little, a couple of those little volunteer fire departments down here that have the beer machine. Again, and I know I keep emphasizing this. We hope we should be holding volunteers to the same standards, but we, we need flexibility in how we meet those standards. And if you do that and you say, you know, and I'm gonna be I'm also gonna be really blunt here. This sounds harsh and I'm gonna offend someone and I apologize, but it's not it's not a presentation for me, it's not a speech for me if I hadn't if I hadn't at least gone after one sacred cow. Not everyone has the same qualifications. If I'm running a service, and I could say some stories, but we'll just use this purely in the hypothetical. If I'm running a 911 volunteer EMS service, we're you know we're combination department. We've got we we keep at least one truck in service. Sometimes we put two or three in service, depending on what's going on. And I've got someone applying whose ink just dried on what we uh, you know most states call it emergency medical responder. Uh, Texas, we call it ECA, emergency, emergency care attendant. If I've got somebody whose ink has just dried on that, and I've got someone who, let's say, is a 10-year paramedic, who should I spend more? Who should I spend more time getting? Who should I spend more time and effort and show more flexibility in getting on board? That 10-year paramedic ideally is going to need maybe a couple shifts of showing them this is where the bathrooms are this is how to gas up the truck 
This is how to resupply. This is how we do our paperwork. And pretty soon they're good to go. That's the person who I want to spend the time, the effort, and the effort recruiting. Not saying that I won't on the other person, but, you know, yes, we need volunteers, but there is a factor of what can you do for me? And we need to be practical about that. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've got somebody who's an experienced paramedic and, you know, not under any state sanctions on their license and has a pretty good track record, I would, I would probably, if I was chief somewhere, I'd be jumping at that going, how soon can you, how soon can we talk to you and when can we start getting you uh, scheduled for uh, training and to get you uniforms? All right. So we have gone uh, the, the last hour talking about everything, uh, volunteerism and EMS, volunteerism in general. And uh, kind of talked about the recruiting and retention side, the the uh, multiple avenues to to helping that to to help address some of the sharp uh, decline that we've seen in the volunteerism side. We want to thank Wes for another great episode, being our first two time handoff uh, uh, guest. So, uh, sir, thank you. If you would uh, remind everybody how to get a hold of you in the uh, event they'd like to go on with this conversation a little bit further, please. Sure. Um, easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, first of all, I'm easy to find on Facebook. Wes Ogilvy, just do a search for me. Um, my, prof my profile, I do not say where I work for either law or EMS. That way I can't be blamed. They can't blame me. Um, I do have a website or, that I do my blog on. It's www theambulancechaser.com and also email west.ogilvy at gmail.com um, I, I don't mind getting email I do, I, the, only, the only thing I mind is people asking for free legal advice I do which, you're gonna free, do, which you're going to do anyways but you know I do, I, I do give free barbecue advice go to Memphis <laughs> <laughs> hey, I will tell you something. Rendezvous for ribs, I'm absolutely on board with that. I am absolutely on board with the rendezvous. I actually lived in, in Memphis for a few years as a kid, so I'm good with I'm good with Memphis for ribs, but I will tell you for the for the complete package, you still gotta come to Texas. And I if any of y'all come back down this way to Austin, I've got a place about 45 minutes out of town that I will take you to that will change your life. <laughs> I do have to say that I, I, I did, uh, while I was in Texas a few years ago, my wife and I uh, met up down there and uh, we went to a place that was actually rated. Uh, they had won the world championship of barbecue down there in Austin. And everybody was like, hey, you have to get, get there by a certain time. And, uh, Franklin's. and I believe so. That sounds about right. So it was, it was absolutely phenomenal. But uh, Overrated. Uh, being more, being, being, well, hey, it's still a Texas barbecue. Uh, one way or another, and uh, while, while I was born in Memphis, I, I will give some props uh, to to Texas, but you can't you can't get uh, can't uh, overrate the, or underrate their Memphis. So, no, Bradley or Eric, uh, any last thoughts from you guys? Uh, the only thing I'll say is, I, I agree. I think a lot of places do a um, horrible job of recruiting and retaining volunteers. So. The three things I will point out are, you know, continuously demonstrate appreciation for your volunteers and your personnel. Use clear position descriptions and set goals and expectations for those individuals and provide updated equipment and creature comforts. Those are the things that will keep people around. Oh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that in the creature, on the creature comforts. I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Bradley. Um, honestly, having a bedroom, having showers, um, having a kitchen having and having a wi-fi access makes it where people want to come to the station if you have people at the station your calls get covered yep i'm leaving here tonight and going to a volunteer station to to do some time tonight and i'll bet you have yeah. all those things i do you know I, I had i had one chief and i love her to death and i'll get i'll give a shout out to her on my final note christy graves she went so far as to make sure that we had linens for the beds and towels at the station. Wow. 
Oh, and a and a washer dryer uh, with detergent. Yeah. You literally. She didn't care if you did your own laundry at the station. I probably shouldn't say that, but you know, you do that. It sure makes it sure makes it easy for people to come in. It takes away the excuses. Well, again, we want to thank uh, Wes uh, for taking his time out to to record and talk to this very uh, important issue. And so as we conclude today, we would like to say that we always look forward to recording these episodes, engaging with each one of you. But however, without your feedback, we do not know what you're thinking. So make sure and subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast, plat- podcast platform, uh, which also helps recognize our host in gems. But also don't forget uh, to uh, visit us on our uh, Facebook group page at the EMS Handoff. And uh, recently, Eric opened up that Instagram at the same as well, the EMS Handoff. So you can find us on both of those. And hopefully very soon, you'll be finding us on our very own uh, EMS Handoff uh, website. Uh, and that more information is coming soon. Lots of new information uh, coming up here in the future. So as we always say, be safe, do great things, go home at the end of the shift, and always remember the value of your EMS Handoff.